Okay. So for those that are here, um, I want to welcome you to the very first why and how of the next season. And we are really excited today to be presenting the topic of foodscaping for beginners in Southwest Florida with uh, Ms. Kamala Perez. If you are not familiar with Growing Climate Solutions, and this is the first time you're joining us, although I, I believe there are a few of us here, um, just a reminder from last year, Growing Climate Solutions is a regional initiative. We're based out of the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. And the aim is to develop a network of institutional institutions and individual stakeholders. So some of you are individuals, some of you represent groups that are here and gather together to build awareness of climate in our region and the changes in our climate. The idea is that we have to build resilience to these changes in the future. And some of that will happen by protecting the natural assets that make our community so unique. We also want to empower others that haven't sort of joined on the bandwagon to support and engage in equitable solutions. And there are a variety of them. So this topic of foodscaping and how we um, address our open land and our natural lands is a really important piece of it. We seek to create visibility for local solutions by featuring them and making us a model for others. And the goal overall is to advance a healthy and prosperous, resilient community. Um, after, after all, climate will impact the whole country. And we want to make sure that our region is not at a competitive disadvantage to others. And we have a lot of vulnerability. So it's really important that Floridians band together early on. So how does growing climate solutions function? Um, we operate in basically three ways. We provide education through a series of sort of virtual online lectures or either Bridget or I, my associate, go out to different organizations. We meet with um, clubs or HOAs and we present this why and how series. We've also done some project work where we work with these institutions or other organizations to help them get sustainable projects in the ground. So that can be everything from tree plantings to um, working with the Resilience Compact or helping different partners advance solar projects, um, landscaping, treescaping, even energy audits or, or you know, whatever is their need, they can turn to us as a resource. Finally, we do communications. We have a bi-monthly newsletter. We're out on social media posting relevant new articles and um, blogs. We have an educational flyer um, that provides all the new events that you can participate in the region. So by way of introduction, I'm Anna Pushkin Shevlin and on with us today is Bridget Washburn. And together we manage all these different steps. Bridget's expertise is more in the natural environment and mine is in the built environment. So we complement each other. Feel free always to reach out to either of us if you need some help. So how did we come upon these why and how workshops? Um, through the three years that we've been operating, we heard from our stakeholders that it's great to hear big numbers and big studies done by academic institutions, but what do I do at my house? What should I do tomorrow to be a better world citizen? So we created the why and how workshops to um, drive practical information on a specific topic, like why should we do this and how do I get it done? And the focus was to really get local experts to focus on local solutions. So today's speaker is you know, particularly talking about, hey, you wanna turn your landscaping into something really useful that can feed you. This is why you should do it. And here are the practical steps to getting it done. Later on in the series, and this series goes on once a month, the first Wednesday typically of the month at 11. The December one is gonna feature climate and mental health. As we recover from Hurricane Ian, we know that people are stressed and there are lots of mental health implications of both disasters and climate anxiety. Up in January is um, Alicia Lopez talking about getting up to speed on electric vehicles. It's a big year for electric vehicles. Lots of people are thinking about it. How do you go about purchasing one? What do you need to know? This will be followed by um, Holly Lixenfeld, who will talk about the, how the Inflation Reduction Act impacts you as a household. What are the benefits of it? 
And then later on in March, we have a topic on solar and we're gonna close out the series with I'm salty about food waste. Uh, Miss Susan Tavez, who is a chef focused on reducing food waste. Since we are all on in a um, workshop format, we want it to be casual, we want engagement, um, but we also want it to be pleasant for everyone. So quickly, the Zoom etiquette, we are not in webinar format, we're in meeting. So if you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute so we don't have dogs and barking and doorbells. We are recording this. So if you've missed it or know somebody who missed it, tell them they can sign on. It will be on our website within a week or so. We want to encourage dialogue. We want you to ask questions to Kamala. So let her present for the first half hour and then we'll have a nice discussion afterward. And toward the end, we'll have a quick three, per, three question poll or survey. So we hope that you'll participate. And without further ado, let me introduce again or welcome back to Kamala Perez. She was born here in Florida and graduated from Florida Gulf Coast University with a bachelor's degree in environmental science. Um, she went to work for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and currently works for Collier County, but she's here with us today in her capacity as a master gardener. So without um, taking up more of Kamala's time, welcome Kamala, welcome back. And we're really looking forward to hearing how we can make our landscape more productive. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate coming back. Um, I'm super excited about this, but I'm not going to say that I'm an, an expert on this topic yet. I'm just getting there, and I just wanted to share like my um, journey and my enthusiasm to try to get others um, on a similar path. So can I share my screen? Yes, you are a co-host, I think. So just share screen. Okay, how does that look? It's starting. There you go. Okay, so, oh, I'm already going ahead. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk to everyone um, and, uh, about foodscaping in South Florida because as many of us know, uh, growing food and growing just, you know, plants in general down here is quite different than other areas. But today I wanted to use this 20 minutes to try to excite everyone to grow food in their own average landscapes, um, even if they're in HOAs. So the talk's going to include, is not going to include a discussion of what you guys see here, which is row crops, raised garden boxes, and square foot gardening. What I'm, I want to talk about and present today is about the landscape that you already have right now and how I think that we can all get food from that landscape and still meet the HOA requirements for the beauty standards. Uh, over the past few years, I've been reading a lot on the topic. I've started gathering my you know, different shrubs and trees and planting some stuff. Um, and I've been listening to a number of the University of Florida talks on this subject. So I feel pretty uh, excited and strongly that we need to start thinking about these uh, landscapes as, you know, a sustainable means for moving forward. Um, you know, in our it, like it's it needs to start to start at home, right? In our own backyards and our own front yards. That change to more sustainable practices, right, in our backyard. So one of my master gardener uh, companions is on the line today, but I did want to talk just a second about the master gardener program since I am here as a Master Gardener today. So the mission of the Master Gardener program is to assist the extension agents in providing research-based horticultural education for Florida residents. So IFIS uh, stands for the Institute of Food and Agricultural Science. Uh, as Master Gardeners, we are required to take uh, quite a rigorous amount of class study and exams, but in the end, we're here to be a support to the community. So we're required to give a certain amount of uh, volunteer hours every year. Some of that is done at the Yard and Garden Show. Some of that is done like today, giving talks to the to the local um, residents. And then we're, we also have things like, you know, plant clinics and the hotline where you guys can get assistance for different pest problems that you might not be able to identify properly or even like invasive plants that are in your own yard. So we're always there to help and there's the, the telephone numbers on the screen, but we also have uh, email that you can also send stuff to us also. 
and uh, Maureen is on with me today, but there's quite a few different master gardeners that you know do different jobs throughout the county. So let's talk about foodscaping for a second. So what, what are we actually talking about? Well, if we look at the definition that's presented by uh, the author that's kind of considered the leading authority on this, and I'm gonna hold up her little book so this is where I got a lot of the information that I'm gonna be presenting today is from this book called The, the uh, Foodscape Revolution. And her name is Brie Arthur. And her definition is foodscaping is the logical integration of edibles in a traditional ornamental landscape. And if you haven't heard of Brie Arthur and you're interested in the topic by the end of my talk, then I would definitely recommend looking up her books. I think she has two or three now. Um, but this was the first one that she put out, and it's the foundation um, of my talk today. Uh, I personally like the definition by the UF professor, Gail Hansen. Uh, she's a landscape architect, and she uh, described and defined foodscaping as the artful combination of edibles in a traditional ornamental garden. Um, so, you know, we, we want to see what, what I'm actually talking about, right? So we're not talking about square foot gardening, but we're talking about stuff that looks more like this. And I did pull the, the picture on the left from Brie Arthur's book, and she actually is in the Carolinas, I think, if I remember correctly. So obviously, our yards can't look exactly like this, but I want you guys to get a feel for it's just a traditional garden, right? It's not a, a row crop. It's not, you know... Um, a traditional herb or vegetable garden that might be in a backyard that you're hiding tucked away. Um, the one on the bottom right I pulled off of a local um, website, but that also is um, an area here in South Florida that has natives mixed with some other food type food plants um, like cassava, which I'm going to talk about later, and bananas, which obviously is a tropical plant that does well here. So the this is more what we're talking about today. but. Um, in particular that you know her uh, yard on the left you'll see a, that mixture of plants that are edible but also with regular flowering plants um, that your that your hoa wants to see in your front yard um, so it, we know it's hard to grow plants down here if you don't pick the right plant um, and here in collier county i would consider that you know we have a, a tropical to subtropical environment down here and we need to pick the right plants so I'm going to talk about the foodscape techniques a little bit um, because I do consider myself a plant nerd. I am going to talk a little bit about um, the types of native edible plants that you might find here. And then I'm going to give you some information for like designing and how to get around some of the HOA um, or, um, architectural review committees to be able to do some of this in your backyard. Okay, so um, for me, uh, you know, I, I worked in for DEP for a few years and in Golden Gate Estates, I used to see a lot of native plants that I over time would find, you know, berries of certain plants were edible. And then in other books that I read, um, you know, cattail can be eaten like corn um, if cooks cooked properly and duck potato or Sagittaria, you know, is called potato for a reason. So there's all of this like really sparked my interest. But the first part of this talk, uh, like I said, it is going to talk about, you know, picking the right plants um, for our area. So I wanted to give some examples uh, of stuff that might be interesting for you guys right here in our area. So the picture on the left is just a standard oak tree, which acorns are edible. I know the squirrels probably enjoy them more than most of us want to eat them, but it is an edible plant um, and it, it can it, it, it serves a lot of valuable um, commodities for our landscape and for our habitat and environment down here. But what if we just take, you know, what we have already and start to plant vegetables and herbs around that? So you could get into something like this picture on the left that's got, you know, uh, ornamental gingers, I think, in that picture, and then the oak tree, but they are putting in uh, ornamental ground cover, like you know, uh, potatoes at the, the base of it. But there's ornamental gingers, and that can also you know be like some mixed with edible ginger in the landscape. So perhaps you're more motivated and want to try something like the picture on the right, which that picture is you know a mixed garden of like 
cabbage and dill and different herbs with other flowering species. So the idea is keeping it, you know, where it's pretty and somebody wants to look at it, but you can sneak those food sources in there um, and then put it adjacent to a walkway or an arbicola hedge that might already be in your landscape. And then, you know, rosemary bushes can be very lovely. So if you do the design in, in a um, way that the HOA is gonna enjoy seeing, then I think that makes it a lot more palatable for us to do some of this stuff right in our own, you know, front yard. Okay, so I wanted to get into um, the, uh, the basis of the, the steps, you know, to get going. So establish the landscape zones that you, that you already have. Um, it may be that you're with an HOA that already has, you know, a designed landscape that, that you kind of have to stick within, but that doesn't mean that you can't put in a fruit tree that's going to mix into that, or maybe there's something that you can remove from that zone and plant something more desirable and edible within that area. Um, honestly, there's a number of edible trees and shrubs that are in my yard right now, and they're waiting to be that foundation for an edible food garden. But, you know, I'm just laying that foundation now. So starting with the trees and the shrubs is, you know, the first step after you figure out the, the beds that you have there. So what is the exposure? How much water, you know, is, is in, that, um, in that area? And what type of shape can you maybe extend? So can you, you know, make that line a little further out where you could put some uh, tomato plants on the edge or maybe a row of kale um, on that edge that's going to be beautiful if you if you plant it in the right design fashion where you're grouping it all together. Um, but heavy in the foodscape revolution, Brie Arthur talked about doing a heavy em emphasis of ornamentals towards the street and the neighbors and then uh, taking the more edible plants and putting them closer like tucked to the house. So kind of, you know, figuring out what you have first. Oops. Oh my gosh, how do I get all the way to the end? Sorry, guys. Don't look. <laughs> Somehow I hit end and it went all the way. Okay, and then uh, once you figure out what that bed is like, you know, this is the, um, can the irrigation zone be changed? You know, what is the sun exposure that you're dealing with? You also need to think about the soil and the preparation for that area before you can plant anything additional. So as uh, master gardeners, we always talk about soil sampling and then amendments as needed. Uh, if you intend on you know, eating what you're growing there, you really need to know what is, you know, what is going on in your landscape as far as the way it's being managed. And I know this is complicated and can be difficult when you're dealing with an HOA because if the fertilization and the pest control is part of those HOA services, then you are going to have to take the extra steps to work directly with um, your uh, property manager and your board to be able to figure out what is being done because obviously you can't have certain chemicals being sprayed onto the plants that you're going to be eating. Um, so maybe taking those extra st steps is something that you have to do. It just depends on what your association um, issues are because in my community, nobody's, you know, we're all doing our own landscaping, um, but we do have architectural standards. So everybody's situation is going to be a little different. Okay, so the next step is kind of picking those plants, right? You need the trees and the shrubs um, picked out before you can figure out where they're going to go. Um, for instance, I, I want to plant elderberry in my yard, but I can't mix that with um, the beauty berry, which I have pictured here on the bottom, you know, the picture that's here on the, on the right hand side. Um, Beautyberry is an upland plant that doesn't like to be in saturated conditions. It does like, you know, a little bit of sun and shade combination. It doesn't, it does okay in full sun, but you really need to know your plant um, for, you know, picking what plants you wanna want to have in your yard and then figuring out where they're gonna be happy. Um, but elderberry, you could mix because it's a wetland plant that likes, you know, saturated conditions. You could mix that with something like a banana tree that likes to be wet for, you know, a more extended period of time. And then the next, next thing is really think about that, that design. So as master gardeners, we learn, um, we do like a whole section on designing landscapes. And it's really important to figure out what you have and do that like inventory, and then figure out what types of plants you might be able to put in that bed together. And then, um, 
it's always ideal aesthetically to put big groupings and not have, you know, people like to see order. So like in the picture here that I, I pulled from Brie Arthur's book, she put the low ground covers, you know, grouped. So like grouping a whole section of like, you know, purple cabbage or something uh, as your ground cover is gonna be um, very aesthetically pleasing and something that the HOA is not gonna fight over. But when you do things real dis, dis, uh, organized and random, then uh, you know sometimes the aesthetic uh, levels are not being met. So take your time with that design. If you already have you know, something there, that doesn't mean that you can't work with it. It just means that you might have to you know, uh, work with the HOA uh, as to what things you can and can't do. Um, maybe you can remove the boring box hedges and replace that with like cranberry hibiscus, or perhaps that you can just make that, that bed a little larger so that you can put the edibles on the edge, like I mentioned earlier. But start small and keep it, keep it simple at something that you know is manageable. Um, and doesn't get too many complaints right away. A few sweet potatoes on the ground or like, you know, kale or something is easy to kind of sneak in there, but you can also do like tomato plants, uh, you know, on a tomato cage in the bed, you know, is, is something that you can make look nice. The trellises and those types of things can be pretty um, when they're integrated correctly. Okay, so I want to, and don't, yeah, the last thing, number eight there is like, make sure that you're mulching because the mulch is going to add that like nice hard edge that keeps that orderly appearance. So having good organic mulch uh, that's going to provide that kind of moisture that your plants need. And then it's also going to um, provide that aesthetic appear, uh, appearance that you need for the HOA. And then color is where you, you can, you know, add in your ornamental flowering stuff uh, in between the, you know, your vegetable garden uh, or your vegetables and your herbs. And then that helps with pollination, which I'll talk about again in a minute. Um, these are the ones that, I mean, there's so many plants that are actually considered edible um, that I can't in this 20 minutes talk about everything that you could possibly pull from the native plant books because you know, there's just too many for us to, to go over. And I've watched multiple talks, but I mean, saw palmetto and pigeon plum and even ficus, uh, strangler, strangler fig. Um, it, those things are all considered to have edible fruits, but is it something that your, your family and you want to eat? That's where you really have to determine what plants you want in your yard. So these are some of the ones that I actually have in, in my yard or I intend to get eventually. So the beauty berry is a, it's a pretty plant that you can also eat and use the, the berries to make different things. So there's jellies and jams. Um, there's actually, I found a recipe for a cake that you can make from it. But then they, you know, a lot of these plants also have medicinal qualities too. Like uh, I had read that beauty berry actually can repel mosquitoes, ants and ticks if you just take the leaf and like rub it on your skin. So there's so many, it's such a big world to get into that it can get overwhelming. But I try to focus on what, what am I going to want to eat? What is my kids going to want to eat so that I can put them out there like picking berries and helping me like sow seeds, you know? Um, so mulberry is another one. There's native, native uh, varieties, but then there's cultivars too that you can get that are uh, dwarf varieties. Some of them, you know, you can get some uh, uh, different varieties that have different, you know, aesthetics that are more pleasing. Um, this, the picture on the bottom here is actually a blueberry. It's a native blueberry. And I actually have a couple of those, although that's not how pretty mine is. So I snagged that picture, but um, you have to have more than one plant when you're gonna do blueberries. Otherwise they're, you're not gonna get uh, the fruit that you need from it. Um, cocoa plum is one that we have in our, you know, average landscapes, but we turn them into little box hedges instead of letting them flower and fruit like they want to. Um, but it is edible. There's plenty of different recipes for, you know, jellies and jams on that one. Uh, sea grape is actually one that um, is used to even make wine. And it's very tolerant and one of our salt uh, tolerant plant species that's native. So it'll deal with surge and salt spray. And then, um, you know, obviously the, the plant can be, um, can be eaten too. So lots of benefits on that one. As far as sable palms, a, a lot of you may recognize that the Swamp Cabbage Festival 
uh, actually harvests and eats the sable palms or cabbage palm, um, but that does kill the actual tree. So, I mean, it's an edible plant, but do we want to all be chopping down the sable palms to eat them? Um, but then elderberry is one that I um, still am trying to collect for my garden, but it's a wetland plant. It's considered a little on the weedy side, but it's the flowers are edible and the berries are edible. It does uh, take a variety of soil types and sun conditions. Uh, it can be mixed with other, like, you know, like I said earlier, banana, bin, banana trees that like a little bit more water um, because it does require a little bit more. Um, pruning is important on that one because it can get a little like weedy um, or it can break if it's not pruned properly. Um, and it can look similar to some other plants that are considered toxic. So make sure that you guys know what you're buying when you get stuff. And I did want to um, give a mention that, you know, some of this stuff may or may not be hard to, to stumble across. Uh, Echo does sell a lot of plants there if you've ever been to the Echo farms up in North Fort Myers. So some things can be purchased, you know, up there, but there are other native plant nurseries around that do have some of these plants that you can get a hold of. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about vines because a lot of people consider grapevine a nuisance, but grapevine actually does have a very delicious grape, uh, the muscadine grapes that come from our native grapevines. Uh, they're obviously you can use them to make um, jellies and jams and there's actually a few wineries in central Florida that you can buy wine uh, for, from those grapes too so it has a lot of uses for the fruit. Passion vines, there's a bunch that are native, but then you can also get uh, cultivars too that are in the commercial industry. They've got all kinds of different uses um, medicinally too. So there's a lot, a lot of uses for different passion vines and passion fruit. Uh, as far as blackberries, this is one that is mostly an upland plant. So it's that, you know, what I said about right plant, right place is super important, even, you know, with, especially with this stuff, but with every plant, you have to know what you have and what it likes before you can figure out where to install it. Um, there, they tend to be a little bit more, um, more sensitive to fertilizer. So this is where, you know, knowing what your HOA is doing on your yard, if you're going to put something like that in, you have to be more careful of it getting too much, you know, cross fertilization. Um, let's see. Oh, you can also get some of the, the blackberry varieties are um, created without thorns, which can be a benefit. And then this, I wanted to show you guys some more examples. I just love this one. This was in the Sebring area. Uh, and it just shows what you can do in the right, you know, area. And even down here, like all of these plants will do fine here. They've mixed, you know, different uh, uh, sunflowers and sun, beach dune sunflower with different cabbages and kale. Uh, and ultimately, it's just a decorative hedge, right, that can be eaten. So it's beautiful to look at. They're using the fence as a support line so that, you know, some of the stuff uh, in the picture on the right, you can see some of the ornamental sweet potato or ipomea, you know, vines. Uh, and it's just, you know, lovely to look at. And uh, a lot of it is edible, too. So back to, you know, what I mentioned a little earlier about, you know, plant stuff that you guys are interested in eating, right? So like star fruit and mangoes are a big one that I have in my yard because that's what my kids like. Uh, they'll go out there and pick the fruits up off the ground and, you know, it gives that extra effort for it being worth it when I know that it's, you know, fruits that are going to be delicious and they're actually going to eat. But knowing your plants, bananas um, are delicious, but there are hundreds of varieties I'm finding. And some of them taste differently, a little, you know, a little differently than others. So making sure that you can find the right one that you guys are interested in, in eating. Uh, the picture that I found on the left here just gives you a good example of papaya. But then, you know, some of these plants that, that I mentioned earlier need some type of support. You know, they're a vining plant, so it's got passion vine that they're using as the papaya as the support for that plant. Um, and then in the middle, I'm showing cassava, which I, I have in my yard, which has these lovely like tropical kind of leaves. It is a root plant that's similar to potatoes. Um, it grows really well down here. 
Um, I've harvested it and they're easy to like replant. So you can harvest and then take clippings off and replant it to get another round of cassava for the next year. And then on the right hand side, it, I pictured um, Monstera deliciosa. And if you guys haven't had this one before, it's the um, plant, it looks, it's in the philodendron family. So the plant looks very similar to the philodendrons. It's like, I think one of the common names is split leaf philodendron, but the Monstera plant has this delicious fruit that to me, it tastes like pineapple, but that would be an easy one for us to swap out, you know, the traditional phil philodendrons with something that is an edible variety um, that you shouldn't have, you know, too much problems with the HOA allowing you to do something like that. A couple other examples. Uh, the one on the, the left, I just wanted to remind everyone about, you know, the edge, uh, keep trying to keep those open edges more sunny for some of our herbs. And then the mulch, you know, obviously helps and it keep that nice, clean appearance. But then mixing in different flowers, like um, there's purple cone flower. And that one on the left will help with the pollinators that you need to attract to be able to um, do the pollination for some of your, you know, fruits and, and um, flowers. And then the picture on the right is lemongrass, which is a, a great edible for down here. It does prefer, you know, full sun and it has to be given lots of space. So this one, you really need to know how much space that, you know, that you've got for it. It's going to get about six to seven feet tall and bushy, but it could go in a spot where um, maybe right now you have uh, Fakahatchee grass. You could substitute this one in there and it, the, um, the, uh, plant can be used for soups, different curries and teas. Uh, as far as like, you know, the herbs, herbs and, you know, vegetables, make sure you know what herbs like what. So for instance, you know, cilantro, mint, and basil and parsley, they prefer to be on the wetter side. So you're going to group those, you know, in an area that's getting a little bit more water, but then stuff like rosemary and oregano and sage, they like it a little drier. So, you, you know, you can group those in, a, in, that, in an area that's not going to get as much water, a different zone. But don't forget the pollinators. Uh, we have to get those, the flower, flowers in there for the HOA. You need that color. So put in the um, uh, celosia and the, and the lantanas in there, zinnias, that will, the pentas too. A lot of the pollinators really like pentas. So even though it's not a native, uh, it is going to help with the pollination that you need for some of these fruits and vegetables. Uh, and some of them are native. So the two on the left, the lantana and the beech dune sunflower, those are native um, and you know, beneficial for lots of different you know, butterflies and wildlife. So in summary, uh, I just want everybody to get out there and start doing uh, some research and what they can you know, put into their yard and start giving us some case studies and more pictures that I can put into presentations. I'd love to help anyone that's interested in taking on a project. So I think the Master Gardeners can use you know, the volunteer hours to help with some of the, the um, the locations that people might be struggling with and at least look over, you know, different designs that people might have in mind uh, and get, give feedback about what we think you could change to make it more successful. But inventory what you have there, uh, test and amend your soil, make sure that you understand the zones and the beds that you have and how you might be able to alter or change them to fit the foodscape need. And then carefully pick your plants ahead of time because we need to group them uh, properly by water and sun condition. And then use, use the resources, like you, master gardeners are a resource, but then as I mentioned, I'll, I'll go back to this one, but I mentioned that the Foodscape Revolution book that I've got shown here, but also this, this is the other book that I used um, when I was researching for this, and it's called The Edible Wild Plants of Florida. And it's by Peggy Lance. So that, that book actually gives you all kinds of different recipes for like, uh, that's where the beauty berry cake was in the back of that one. Um, so there's lots of different ways that she goes through how you would actually use like even cattail. I think she spends like three or four pages on how you can use cattail. Um, but I mean, there's so many different uh, natives out there that have been used for food, like kunti, for instance. I love kunti. It's a plant that is a, the host for our Atala butterfly, but the Seminoles used to use it to make flour for, um, you know, for making their bread 
And then I also had read that it was used for uh, as a like a starch substitute for animal crackers for a long time. But it's a long lived plant. So, you know, that's one that I'm not going to be planting coon tea to be eating it because I want it there, you know, for habitat and wildlife. So it's just figuring out what plants everybody's interested in, how they can sneak them in there. I was going to put that page back up with my resources, but there's a lot of information out there that um, we can provide as master gardeners. And I'll open it up for questions. Well, thank you so much for that. That was a lot of information. And um, I guess what I'll do is kick it off just to make everyone feel comfortable with the first couple of questions. And then right. if everyone wants to take their mic off or a small enough group, we can have a nice discussion together. So my first question as a person who can't seem to grow anything um, is how do you, you said the first step is to test your soil and amend it. So how do you do that? Okay. And then, and that, and then followed by, are there certain combinations of flowers and um, plants and edibles that you would recommend for the very beginners? Like if you kill everything, these are the ones that aren't hard to grow. And you know, are there synergistic combinations that we should think about to start with? Uh, that's a that's a tough one. Let me start off with the the easier beginning one. So the soil test stuff, we actually have uh, soil test kits at the university extension office. I actually have some at my office too. So you can reach out to the master gardeners and we will give you all of the equipment and the directions for collecting a soil sample. And then it goes to actually the soil lab in Gainesville. So you'll collect it. You, it's a composite sample. So you're going to take a bunch of different, you know, um, plugs basically from the area that you want to start your, um, you're growing your, you know, the install of these new plants. So you'll put it all in like a bucket and then you ship it off to the lab and the lab will actually give you an, a, you know, a full rundown of what you might be missing in the soil um, or what you've got that you don't need to worry about. And then they'll also give you like some recommendations for amendments if you need it. So really it's like laying the foundation is the most Im important first step. You know, make sure that everything is good conditions before you start to install anything. Um, and then the second one, I, I'd actually lean on uh, Maureen a little bit more, but we could probably get some additional resources as far as like what things, like I mentioned, you know, rosemary and, and sage, you can put together uh, in a dryer bed, but like uh, things like um, parsley might need to be a little wetter. So maybe you're gonna put it with mint, like certain things don't like to dry out. Um, and I, I can't think of, a resource that does all of the leg work for you. That's why for me, it's really picking out what things do you want to grow, like getting that whole list of the things that you want. And then it's easier to figure out what things you can mix together. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, if you look at the chat, I think Tony had a question. Tony writes, are, cultivate, are cultivars considered as native plants for the benefit of insects, birds, and other native critters? Um, I'm not sure I'm confident enough to answer that. So cultivars are usually like a hybridization um, of a native genus, you know, and it's gonna be, it, it will, a lot, in a lot of cases, it'll have the genus and species will be the same, but the, the cultivar name, you know, it'll have some type of additional features so it should still attract the same wildlife as far as like, you know, if it is, if it's a host plant, it should still be a host plant, but if they've changed it enough, like a lot of times the blue, like the blackberries, they can remove the thorns by, you know, constantly breeding, but it's still going to be the same plant um, as far as the genus and species. So I'm not sure I'm a, a good enough expert to answer that, but that that's my best answer. Does anybody else want to speak up? You may want to turn your screen share off yes. so that we can see each other. There we go. There. Any other questions? I, I think it, de it depends on the, the plant, I think is the best answer on that. Okay, I won't be shy First since there art. aren't questions. So you're talking to the person of the built environment. Remember I made that introduction? Yeah. 
So I can't grow things and I don't know how to grow things, which is a real problem. Um, but when you grow potatoes and sweet potato, they're underground. How do you know when they're ready? A lot of times with the cassava, it's a, it's a timing thing. So like I'll put a date on my um, calendar and I will check them after like 13 months and, and I'll pull them. So it depends on the plant. Maureen probably has other plants like that that she might Sure. So sweet potatoes, you would plant as a slip and there are different varieties, but generally maturity is a hundred days. So once you plant the slip, then a hundred days is when you would start to take them out of the ground. That's a great crop to start sweet potatoes and you would plant them generally in April or May. I have a question, Kamala. So you had the blueberries on there and we go through a lot of blueberries. Um, are they the same as like the Northern blueberries or are they like small? I just didn't know we could really do blueberries. I thought they were like a cold weather crop. Nah, they like, I'm, I've had the Darrow's blueberries and I still haven't gotten fruit off of them. So they like, it's a smaller, it depends on the blueberry. So there's a bunch of different varieties of them. Um, and you can get some of them in a larger bush form. And then the Darrow's are a small one. So I keep it in a pot, but because I've got two plants, but I don't know if I, I've like given them enough food that they're like cross pollinating. Um, but I still haven't gotten fruit off of them. So I'm, st I'm still playing with that, but there are ones that are supposed to do well enough here. Um, it's just getting the right one. Right. And as the person who's tried to grow stuff, everyone says you need to do it in a raised bed so that the wildlife eat. doesn't eat them. Yes. So how, how do you reconcile putting them into your landscaping and then not having bunnies and other iguanas and other things just eat everything up. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I haven't, you know, I haven't had enough. I, I deal with it on, you know, my fruit trees already. So I hope that you've got enough fruit that's coming off of the tree that it doesn't matter if they take a few mangoes and star fruit here and there. Um, I don't have a great answer on that one. Maureen, do you? Like we just have so much wildlife down here as compared to other places that it would be a challenge. And, and, and some are going to be more edible and appealing to wildlife than others. That's the biggest problem with blueberries down here. It's why many of us don't, you know, have tried to plant the native blueberries, but they're not very prolific in fruit and the animals will take them long before they're ready to pick. So blueberries tend to be difficult. Whereas I tend to think there's a 35% wildlife tax. So if yeah. I plant something and the wildlife takes about a third, that's a tax. And I don't mind that. That's, that's our wildlife tax down here in South Florida. But, you know, I would concentrate on something very similar um, and simple, like planting a uh, carambola tree. So we call that the Florida apple or the star fruit and plant that tree. And within five years, it's prolific. Um, lemongrass is another one, very easy. You can buy just a seedling, put it in the ground. Two years later, you will probably have 20 seedlings around and you can pot them up and give them to your friends. Mm -hmm. uh, native mulberry tree, also very easy to grow. When you, of course, plant natives, they don't really need anything else from you. So if you're not a very good gardener, Anna, plant something very simple to start. I um, I planted an avocado tree to replace an avocado tree that the Lake Worth drainage district decided was in the wrong place and they tore out. There should be a tax against that. Government should really not kill food. Um, but the new variety doesn't, the avocados aren't as delicious. Does that, is that because it's a young tree? Do they get better with time? Or is it just a variety? And how do you know which, like where, how do you know which one to pick? Yeah. Like if you don't, if you're not a, a plant expert, how, how do you know, they say, well, this is an avocado tree. Well, how do you know which ones are gonna be the right kind? You have to get the fruit. For me, the mangoes, like I have a Glen mango and there's so many different, there's hundreds of different varieties of mangoes. So you really have to make sure that you know which one that you like before, that's my recommendation. I'm not gonna put a, a tree that's gonna get, you know, 
20 feet in the air in my yard and then find out that we don't like the fruit. So in Homestead, there's a lot of different nurseries that you can go down there and say, I'm looking for this avocado. And I've had avocado here and we killed it. Um, so not all, you know, there are some, and at Echo, they actually teach you that the avocados are best mounded. Like you, they, they, um, they have some soil characteristics that they don't like being, you know, in saturated low soils or um, something related to that. And they mound all of them. So you really have to know what avocado and mango and fruit tree you're getting um, before you put it in the ground and know that that's the variety you like. One option is to go once a year at the IFIX extension on Immokalee Road. They do a mango tasting and yeah. they have maybe 14 different types of mangoes that grow very well in South Florida. And they have samples of the 14 different mangoes. And you can try all 14 so that you know which variety do you prefer of the mangoes that grow well here. Does Echo, Maureen, does Echo sell? They sell some of the fruit up there too, I think. I think Echo is the place to go, to be honest. If you're just starting this and you want to just um, go slow, I would totally recommend going to Echo. They'll show you Katuk and lemongrass and um, our native prickly pear. That would be the best place, I think, to start. Agreed. Kamala. Linda has a question she put in the chat. Can you see it or do you need me to read it out to you? No, I can see it. I have a question. This is my first gardening session and I have a raised bed. Do I go to Home Depot and buy soil to fill it? You, um, you can. I think I'll let Maureen answer that one. She does more raised gardens. I only have one. I put everything in the ground. I handle the gardening at Tommy Barfield Elementary School, and we have four huge raised garden beds. I also, of course, have them at my home. We tend to make our own soil. It's very easy. It's compost, meaning black cow, organic peat, um, and a little bit of perlite. Uh, so there, there are the three ingredients that you would mix together, and that's going to give you the proper pH that you need, which, you know, not to go too into science, but it's around 6.5 to 6.7. So you would put maybe five units of black cow, two units of organic peat, and one bag of perlite. That, of course, is for drainage. And, and that's the best way to do it. But truthfully, you can buy organic raised garden bed soil almost anywhere. So if you don't wanna make it yourself and mix it in a wheelbarrow and just put it in your raised garden bed, then buy bags anywhere. And I, I would say organic is the best. Okay. Especially when it's your food. Yeah, that's, I'm planning on eating what's in there. <laughs> Could you say that ratio just one more time? Sorry, I was writing it down. Sure, five black cow to two peat moss to one and, and, and to one perlite, but play around with it. You know, that's just a rough estimate. This is a rough science here. I have never tested my soil. You can, but for most vegetable gar most vegetables and fruits, that's the soil that they want. So you're gonna put that in your existing soil, churn it up a little bit, put in a little organic fertilizer and plant your plant. I was thinking something about the lemongrass when you mentioned that earlier too. There's a lot of plants that are actual pest deterrents. So Anna, you asked about like, how do you get rid of some, you know, like keep the bugs and the bunnies away from eating the stuff that you're trying to eat yourself. That's like, there's plenty of pet, uh, plants out there that are actually deterrents like that. So mixing in like uh, garlic, you know, is one that I've heard, you know, a lot of the, the um, you know, the wildlife doesn't like. So mixing those types of things together in an area maybe would be a deterrent for some of the wildlife. Well, right before we wrap it up, because we're coming up on the top of the hour, yeah. um, I'm not going to put my PowerPoint back on. I'll just mention it to the small group. Mm -hmm. um, we really hope that as we're kicking off this series that you'll encourage others to come and that you'll sign up for the next ones. As I said, the next one is climate and mental health, and that will be followed by EV cars in January. We also um, hope that you'll share what you learned on social media. Social media 
tells other people who are your friends that you enjoy this programming and it gets you to join. Um, we'd like you to answer just a couple of questions. Bridget's gonna launch a three question poll. If you have a second just to answer those questions, I'd appreciate that. We need to collect some information um, to help us better plan these projects and these um, educational forums. So if you could take a minute to just answer the questions and sign up for the next one, which will be December 7th, um, spread the word because the next one is on mental health and climate. And we believe that post Ian, there are a lot of people that are quite stressed out, both about the change in climate and the impacts of such disasters in our community. So it should, we have a psychologist from the University of Colorado coming to participate with us. It should be kind of interesting. Okay. So is the poll working for everyone? You can just put your answers in there and yeah. it looks like it's going through. Came up, but I can't choose. Is it because I'm set as a co-host? Oh, as a co maybe. I can't. I, we haven't really used the polling before, so this is also a bit of a- We're testing it out. Trial. That's fine. I think you need to pull up the next question, right? Oh, do I? Oh, no, no, you can do them all. You just have to scroll. Right, okay. Okay, we have a lot of people that would prefer noon to one. So that may be something we, we shift in the future because 11 is an odd hour. It seemed to have worked better last year. Well, very good. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out back to Kamala or to us and we'll forward the question. Also, we will put this on, you know, convert it into a YouTube, load it onto our website. So if you know somebody who missed it or somebody who wants to watch it, just go to the Growing Climate Solutions website. There's a resource page, a tab for resources and the why and how presentations are there. Um, feel free to refer that and send it on to others who may find it interesting. And with that, I thank everyone for participating today and um, hope you have a good day. You get your hands dirty in the dirt and you start putting in some, you know, start small, as she said, and um, start doing some fun stuff in your garden. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Thank you.